Carter. I was born in Cannon County at Woodbury. <sighs> Me and my family have been in the farm industry my whole life. My daddy's whole life, all of us. I mean, that's all we've ever did. Growing up on a farm was what you're talking about 60 odd years ago. Back then, we worked mules and I mean, we had no indoor plumbing, no nothing. My name is Diane Bridgewater Bassell and I was born in Carthage, Tennessee. I have lived on a farm all my life and I'm on a century farm, so it's been in our family over 100 years. So all of my life I was raised there, my father's life and my grandfather's life. Probably some of the earliest memories that I had on a farm, my grandparents on my father's side had a grade B dairy. So all of my life as a little kid, we would go to the road and open the gate and call the cows and they would cross the road and walk up to the barn and go to their stalls and we would chain them up to milk. And every afternoon we'd do the same thing again. They crossed the road twice a day. And people would say, well, how did nobody run over them? I said, everybody knew that you milked twice a day and they would watch out for the cows. My name is Samantha Bassell and I'm from Carthage, Tennessee. My parents make me do quite a bit of work, but I've learned from everything I've done. If something happens to like one of my cows and I know how to take care of it and fix it and which vet to call. But it's very interesting, very fun, and it's where most of my memories came from. My main responsibilities are feeding and watering the cattle, sometimes fencing with dad or fixing a tire. I own my own greenhouse business, is Basel Greenhouse. We raise bedding plants, vegetable plants, and a little bit of everything. And then I also have a high tunnel that grows my strawberry plants. Ronnie Basel. I was born in Carthage, Tennessee. My family started farming here on Hogan's Creek in 1917. We're a century farm. Been here 105 years of this year. Very enjoyable to work on the farm. I had two older brothers. I was the baby of the bunch, and uh, we, of course, they picked on me and things like that. But I knew how to ride a horse before I could walk. Drive a tractor also. I think the struggles that farmers are facing right now is a combination of things. You look at the input prices, how they've gone up over the last few years, whether it's the cost of fuel, the cost of fertilizer, uh, those input prices are rising faster than the commodity prices. The, the loss of our agriculture land is another challenge that we're facing. We just, uh, we have fewer and fewer acres to farm and so it's much more competitive to get those acres, whether you're trying to rent acreage or, or purchase it. Inputs are increased each and every year as far as expenses, uh, commodity prices seem to be very volatile. They go up, they go down. Um, right now the cattle markets are up, but they almost have to be for the farmers to even attempt to get a profit right now because of the fertilizer process, the diesel process, things like that. But farmers are also very innovative. So at the end of the day, farmers are gonna come up with a way to get the most bang for their buck. I feel like we are a very, creative community that will do the research and take the necessary steps to do what we have to, to always keep, keep going and keep thriving. Independent farmers right now, the struggle that they face, uh, most of the discussions I have with uh, other farmers is uh, competing with development pressure, uh, land uses that are not, uh, not involved in agriculture. And quite honestly, you know, between the two, uh, Necessities of life being food and shelter. Food seems to be losing out in the agricultural arena. Uh, what we do is of so little economic value, we simply can't compete with the development sector in securing land to produce food or anything else. And we've been commodified to the point that uh, for the individual farmer, it's very hard to compete. There's kind of a saying going around that uh, uh, as farmers, as agriculturalists, we need to tell our story uh, because if not, somebody else will. Um, so environmental changes, um, production changes, market changes, there are a, a whole host of uh, hurdles that, uh, that I think every producer faces on a daily basis. I think there's still a place for the small independent operations. I, I think marketing is going to be critical to those operations. They have to find their niche. And so doing things just because it's the way daddy did it, just, just because it's the way we've always done it, uh, has to kind of go out the window. They have, those small operations have to really have a niche, they have to be unique, and they have to market their operations because people are interested in farmers, they're interested in their stories, and if, if a small operation can tell their story effectively, uh, they, I think they still can survive and thrive even with all the challenges we're facing. 
Well, the question is, do I think that small independent farmers continue to compete in this era of conglomerates and, and consolidated agriculture? A lot of that has to do with the policies as they relate to small agriculture. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, talk about organic, non-GMO. Uh, myself and several other families have done that in addition to commercial agriculture as we know it. And it's extremely hard to get up to any type of scale that can compete with uh, wages earned off the farm or, or to, to continue to expand anything that you may not have inherited. Why do we continue to farm? I would think that I don't know any better, I guess. You know, there's a difference in growing up on a farm and growing up in the city. My kids have grown up on a farm. You know, they understand where their food comes from. And it used to be your families were two or three generations removed, and even the grandparents or things could tell the kids. Most of them now are multiple generations removed from the farm, and they have no idea that milk comes from a cow. They think that it's go to the store and buy it. They don't understand that, you know, if you go to your farmer's market and buy those fresh tomatoes, they're gonna to taste way different than anything you ever buy in a grocery store. You know, and there's a lot of perception about, you know, making the world better. Well, if they would visit their local farmers and buy direct from producers and visit their farmer's market, they cut down that carbon footprint. You know, they make it smaller. Things aren't transported as far. And you're also getting a lot healthier produce, a lot more nutrients because they've not been picked early and gassed to make sure they ripen en route to the store when they're getting them there. Why not I continue to farm in the face of all these challenges? It's just basic Scots-Irish, Tennessean stubbornness. To be honest with you, my own farm is not, not the product of anything that I inherited, but they presented me with all these challenges and I went off on my own. At that particular time, it was a very different time, even if it was just 30, 35 years ago, where we had means for a energetic young person. Uh, we had uh, tobacco at that point in time. Uh, this uh, urban, rural mixing of economies did not exist. Pretty much uh, what we had to, to buy in terms of land and capital uh, was more in tune with an actual agricultural economy. Uh, that was kind of the end of when someone could strike out on their own and actually do pretty well. Some of my friends that, that no doubt have been interviewed even, even in this session, we started out pretty much the same time. Why do I continue? Because I continue to hold hope for the future. <clears throat> that, that by some means this imbalance between the sectors of the economy will be cured and I'm, I think that we may be at the precipice of that for the importance of our food, where it comes from, having relationships with those that are actually helping feed you could turn the tide, but we're at a very, very important inflection point in our society and our economy as to whether we're gonna decide if food domestically produced and having a relationship with those people is worth as much as what we wanna want to pay for a McMansion or some kind of estate out in the rural areas. I continue to farm because I, I don't know anything else. I, I love it. Uh, it's, it's something that you have to love. It's, it's so challenging that if you didn't love it, it would be a miserable life uh, because there's always something that doesn't go right. Uh, everything seems to take longer than you meant for it to on the farm. There's always a flat tire. There's always a busted hydraulic line. There's always some kind of challenge uh, every day and so it would be miserable if you didn't enjoy it. But those who farm uh, typically enjoy it. They love it, it gets in your blood, and even though you may not get rich doing it, probably won't get rich doing it, uh, you continue to do it because you love it. Tobacco program that was, that was run by the farmers came to an end. Uh, I did see an actual end to the culture that I had known and that my father had known and that my grandfather had known. That was difficult. <clears throat> so we went from that to what we could uh, sustain our stuff at. So we went into commercial and poultry production, which is probably a whole nother <laughs> series of documentaries. Uh, that did keep us on the land, and we continued to try to do fruits and vegetables, pumpkins, uh, things like that. But uh, slowly, uh, the commercial side 
actually won over. Uh, there was really nothing else that we could do on a scale of what resources we had that could keep us on the land. So we've kind of had a foot on both sides of the fence, both the ultra, uh, mega commercial, and then trying to uh, maintain those parts of our heritage that meant the most to us. And it's been very difficult. I've lost both of my parents in the last year and a half. And uh, that has been my goal is we've got to keep the farm together, you know, for the kids and grandkids and then their future because I grew up all my life, you know, they don't make more land. And that is true today. And you see it everywhere. Beautiful farms that used to be in full ag production, you know, row crops, corn, beans, and all of that. And, you know, now they're chopped up into you know, half acre lots or acre lots for the big houses and loaded with houses. Well, at some point, if you keep doing that, you're gonna run out of production agriculture, which agriculture is more productive now than it's ever been. You know, you can produce more crops on smaller areas than ever before because they've modernized and been able to figure that out. But, you know, I hope 100 years from now that my kids or their grandkids or their grandkids you know, those children still own that land and it's still in their family, even if they're not maybe actively farming every day like my husband does, but that they have that opportunity if they want to. You know, kids, if you just do nothing but plant a tomato on your back patio, let them learn where their food comes from and that it comes from farms and that, you know, they can grow their own crops. And it's so beneficial because nothing tastes better than something you raised yourself. And that is such a lesson that most of the kids don't ever experience and they don't understand, but we're missing out on that disconnect about where your food comes from. And that is really important to today's society. What I see in society at, at this point in my life is a complete detachment from all those things that are really important in life, which is an attachment to the land, to the wonderful creation that we're surrounded by and having some kind of meaningful interaction with that, which is actually life having an effect on, on life. Whether it's the, the life of the plants and the animals that you're in charge of, that you've been made a temporary steward of, or if it's even the lives that are being enriched by what you're doing. <clears throat> it seems like in today's society we've forgotten that what really has made all of our leisure time possible all that's it's made our vocations away from the land possible <clears throat> is a success that those who have stayed on the land have had in removing those responsibilities and that and that very hard sustenance type farming that 70 percent of the population was engaged in just a mere hundred years ago just to survive we've lost all those attachments and appreciations for those that are still providing that most basic function to life, which is the food that nourishes your bodies. So that's why I stay, is because it keeps me close to the land, it keeps me close to God, and those of my family that remain on the land, it keeps me very close to them. And that's a lot of what's been lost in modern day society, and I just absolutely refuse to let that go until the good Lord calls me home. One of the, the greatest things that I would want to share with folks is that there are opportunities there um, for the everyday consumer to meet and to know and to support uh, their local producers. Uh, that's a, you know, having, having a way to better market our products, whatever they might be, um, is one of the biggest hurdles uh, that producers face. Um, so I think that uh, as a producer is able to pivot and to market products differently, um, that direct-to-consumer option and, uh, and, and marketing strategy uh, is one of the things that, that can honestly keep a lot of these, these farmers in business. You can get a better connection, you can, you can ultimately get a better product, and uh, I think that's one of the biggest opportunities uh, that are coming uh, with, with the generation now and with coming generations.
Well, I, I think uh, the, the one thing I would like to say to people who would are watching the video is I encourage you to work with local farmers and support local farmers. There are a lot of different farm operations out there, and uh, if you can support them by buying locally, you're going to be surprised at the quality of product you get. And oftentimes it's a cheaper price than you would find at the grocery store. And I think if you buy from a local farmer, you'll realize that and will probably continue to do so. And the other thing, even if you don't have a local farmer you can deal with, is, is just to be an advocate for farming and to, to educate yourself. Things that you read on Facebook, the things that you read on, on Google or the internet, they're not all true, okay? There's a lot of misinformation out there about agriculture. And so if you have questions about how your food is grown, I would, encourage you to go and talk with a real farmer, not somebody who has an opinion, who doesn't actually know and hasn't been there, done that, but go find a, a real life farmer and have a conversation with them. And most of the time, they're gonna be glad to talk to you and, and help educate you.